All right, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Livia Obinama. I am the manager of partnerships and local content at the Go Better Government Association. On behalf of the BGA, I want to welcome you to a BGA community forum where we host conversations on issues, impact, and the possible ways forward. Tonight, we're discussing black youth, um, carjacking, and the Cook County juvenile justice system. And you'll hear from investigative reporter Sydney King in conversation with panelists Mark Clements, Anna Marcado, and Miracle Boyd. Following their discussion, we'll open the conversation for questions and then provide you with the survey before closing out uh, with final thoughts from the panelists. Please place your questions in the Facebook Live uh, chat section and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can in the allotted time. A video recording of this event will be available later this week. It will be uploaded onto the BGA YouTube page uh, and shared on our BGA social platforms. Now let's introduce Sydney and the panelists. Sydney King is an investigative reporter at the Better Government Association. A Metro Detroit native, she focuses on conceiving, reporting, and writing stories on government accountability with a focus on equity issues. Mark Clements is a community organizer at the Chicago Torture Justice Center. He advocates for people and communities impacted as a result of police violence, the abolition of the death penalty, and criminal justice reforms. In 1981, then 16 years old, Clements confessed under police arrest to a crime he did not commit. He became the second Illinois juvenile to be sentenced to natural life without parole and served 28 years before his conviction was overturned in 2009. Anna Marcado is the Director of Restorative Justice at Alternatives, Inc. They have been a restorative justice practitioner, educator, and youth organizer for more than 15 years. They also founded the Peace Ambassador Apprenticeship and have developed systems, excuse me, and supports for alternatives to become a model of restorative workplace. And last but not least, Miracle Boyd is a youth organizer at Good Kids Mad City, which works to end gun violence and build community resources on Chicago's south and west sides. She began organizing in 2018 when she and her high school peers protested the closures of four neighborhood schools in Englewood. She currently studies at DePaul University. I'll pass it on to you, Sydney. Thanks, Olivia. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, so last year, there were more than 1,400 carjacking incidents in Chicago, and only 13% of those cases resulted in arrest. Um, of that 13%, my fellow investigative reporter and colleague David Jackson at the Better Government Associ Association and I found that kids as young as 13 were involved in at least 66 carjacking cases. Almost all Chicago teens arrested for carjacking last year were Black and from underserved neighborhoods on the city's south and west sides. In attempts to provide services to these young people who are in the system for carjacking have been made by some individual judges and youth advocates. But as we found through some months of reporting, there are little to no formal services offered to young people who face more serious charges. Um, I'm really glad, Anna, Mark, and Miracle, that you all are here today to discuss this and to be in conversation with each other. You all do very vital work in the community, um, and I just love to jump into the conversation. Um, so, Anna, I just want to start with you. Um, obviously, our reporting was on carjacking, and so it was a big phenomenon, but if you could just shed a little light on, you know, carjacking is considered a violent crime what's entailed in a carjacking and maybe why it's categorized in, in a violent crime and why do the kids who are committing um, or being involved in these incidents are getting that categorization? Yeah, there's um, vehicle hijacking is this term where um, it's, it involves um, uh, taking someone's vehicle by force. And so uh, that's why it's categorized as a, a violent offense. Um, and it's, um, something that we've seen on, a, a rise in, uh, uh, recently, like you were, you were talking about, um, there's, there's also other kinds of classifications. Um, so they're, you know, depending on 
um, a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not an expert on. People get uh, different kinds of charges for vehicle related offenses. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the formal carjacking is, is when it's like taken by force and then it's aggravated if there's a gun involved, is my understanding. Yes, yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for explaining that. And that's kind of what we did see a lot in our reporting. Um, Miracle, I, I kind of want to um, direct this question to you. So, you know, we know, like I said, a lot of the kids who've been arrested for carjacking last year are black and live in historically under-resourced neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, as we've been, you know, digging into this reporting and even, you know, after the story came out, um, some critics pushed back on the idea that the sh city should bear any sort of responsibility um, and intervention for kids charged with carjacking. Um, can you, and anybody can answer this, but Miracle, I, I would like you to start. Um, why do you think these kids deserve or need the city support? I feel like they deserve and need the city support because the simple fact the city has failed them on numerous occasions. CPD, they patrol our streets, they hyper surveillance our streets on the west and south sides of Chicago where black and, youth, black and brown youth reside. And just so happily, they come across desperate, situ desperate situations where they have to attack someone to find a way of life because all they know is survival mode and they have never been given the tools in life to do what they need to do. And that's far as like financial freedom, education that needs to be invested in, equity in education, mental health, like we have a lot of black and brown friends out here and a lot of black and brown brothers and sisters who have lost loved ones to gun violence, but they never heal from losing a friend. Like it's people out here that's getting killed over things that they've been new, been going on since elementary school. Like the beef is real in the streets of Chicago. So I think that we can't keep, continue to blame our black and brown youth when the city ain't giving them nothing to do. They not resource, they not investing in their neighborhood. They taking away from our neighborhoods, they closing our schools, they taking away the mental health clinics so people can't get help. And so yes, you tend to act desperate when they seeking for attention, like this is what we call it. And so I feel like we need to stop blaming the youth and reinvest in our youth and maybe you will see a change because we already know that the police can't, street our, can't keep our community safe. And furthermore, this carjacking term, that's a racist slur. It's been used way back in the 1600s and the term jacking itself is racist. So the fact that we say, oh, these happen in under-resourced communities, this, that, and the third. Okay, if you know this is happening in under-resourced communities, why not fund that community and give those you something to do? Stop putting the blame on people and then saying, you have people out here saying, oh, give them something to do. Well, they don't have anything to do. This is what they resort to when they are not being productive and they do not have anyone they can look up to and any people in their life that care about them or mentors or a community organization that they can reach out to when they feel as though they are in the struggle or they need help or things of that nature. So I feel like it's very important when we talk about putting this stereotype on our black and brown youth and giving them a name that people can go run off and call us because everyone is not the same. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, that thoughtful answer. Uh, Mark, did you have anything to to add in that question? Well, I think that, you know, all of this is institutional racism and it is a form of mass incarceration in which all of the services as Miracle has stated has been stripped and there is honestly nothing for these young children to get involved into out of many communities in the city of Chicago that will steer them from this type of lifestyle. The criminal justice system has made merchandise out of these young children. They have stripped all of the services. They have stripped even services in which to prevent them from being incarcerated uh, inside of our youth facilities. So the bottom line of it is it's profit over the people without reaching a solution to heal the community of young children that is not provided with a fair, a fair playing field. And when you're not provided a fair playing field, uh, you have tendencies to get off into things that uh, basically is not right. Yeah, and Anna, you work in um, restorative programming. Could you talk a little bit about how 
the historic, um, you know, stripping of resources that Mark and Miracle have touched on plays into the work that you do um, today with kids and yeah, just how you see that play out. Yeah, from a, a restorative perspective, really we're looking at what is going to actually work. And for that, um, I think the big thing here is that there's different kinds of violence and structural systemic violence is not something that is addressed by the traditional punitive justice system. And so um, what we're talking about when we're, when we're talking about restorative programs is a, a very different approach to how we get justice. How, what are we talking about when we're talking about accountability? Um, so instead of just looking at it um, inside of this myth that um, you know, it's, it's just about individual players uh, taking these actions, it starts to see us as a, we are all connected. And so um, a big piece of this is working with folks around seeing like when I do something, it impacts other people. And I actually am, start to see myself as a part of a community. Um, and that is what ends up having us be able to um, really make a, a, people feel like when they are connected to each other, they, they, it helps to prevent harm and it helps to address harms that do come up, right? So that's one piece of it. The other part is that um, the, the people in community with someone that does some kind of harm need to also see that um, they are connected to this individual, right? And so it's about uh, us collectively coming up around people um, so that there actually is community around them and uh, that that ultimately is what makes the difference be difference. Um, and it's been shown over and over and over again that it's relationships, strong relationships that, that make an impact on, on young people's lives more than any other factor. And so um, as a community and then as a society, we have to actually come up around young people um, in order for any of this to get any better, right? So um, that's a essentially a restorative approach to it. Say, like, all right, well, you know, how are we going to collectively respond? Not just, you know, who's responsible, like who's gonna, whose life is gonna be ruined now because of this, like wanting people's blood, but really like, how are we going to respond? This is like, all of us can play a part in that. Um, so our, our programs are, um, a million and one experiments and coming up around people. Yeah, um, I, I wanna talk a little bit more later about um, those specific solutions, but just in terms of community, um, you know, one thing that we found in our reporting, or I think everybody could have seen this is earlier in the year when, you know, it was just kind of like this wild, like media story about, you know, carjacking incidents across the city um, and, a little bit of like misguided information in terms of where the carjackings were happening the most. And obviously we found that, you know, they were happening in black and brown communities the most, um, you know, but if you read news stories, you might get a different impression. One thing I wanna ask each of you about is the stigma um, that a lot of these kids are facing or just black youth face in general, um, in terms of the justice system, um, and how does it impact the way that they're prioritized by the system as well? Um, Mark, if you could answer that, that'd be great. Well, how they are basically demon, demonized uh, through media and by our system, it's all to separate families. It's all to basically, uh, incarcerate it's punitive it's no opportunity it's a way to basically uh man commit acts of genocide and basically no one wants 
to listen. I first became aware of this uh, by way of following the Facebook post of uh, Anita Padilla at Fox 32. And I listened to some of her comments and her comments were basically demonizing these young kids, not looking at the fact that most of these kids don't have opportunity. Most of these kids are born to fail. Most of these kids are, before they're born, prison cells are built to put these young kids inside of these prisons. And lastly, what I would like to say is that we have a city that is basically trying to say that, well, they are providing so many services to these young kids and these young kids don't have services. Our criminal court system, uh, it, even if they wanted to send these kids to uh, programming, the laws are so uh, tight and so barbaric where that they cannot send these kids to programs due to the fact that most of them don't exist in our communities. Yeah, um, Miracle, would you, do you have any thoughts on that around the um, stigma facing black youth in the city? Yes. I would like to piggyback and I would like to agree with everything he just said because our black and brown youth are not given opportunities and I want people to stop sitting up here every time something happens or every time you see a black and brown youth on in trouble and being face put on social media, like stop jumping down their throats because you never know what that person had to go through that led them to be this innocent, per I mean, this violent person that, that they came across and this person that have harmed someone. So stop telling our young people they ain't gonna be nothing and stop making them feel so powerless and that they don't have a voice. Get them opportunities. And so I think like that goes to say like our peace book ordinance that GKMC has been trying to get passed on the city and state level is going to provide these wraparound services for our black and brown youth so that they don't have to be in desperate situations where they hurting themselves, hurting other people. And at the end of the day, that they could build peace on their city block because a lot of violence happens across the city of Chicago, across wards. And we don't talk about it every day, but COVID was one pandemic and gun violence is a pandemic here in Chicago. Yeah. Mark, you um, you talked a lot about the media's role um, in you know what you call the demonization of, of Black youth. Um, a critical component of this report that David Jackson and I worked on was reaching out to um, those 66 families that we um, talked about earlier and just kind of trying to understand individually each story. Um, and <clears throat> as investig rep investigative reporters often do, we obtain sensitive information to report this story from confidential sources. Um, in some cases, that's the only way to hold government officials accountable. Um, how do you think that the media's um, relationship with black and brown communities could be improved or potentially um, the strategy of covering criminal justice um, could be improved in such a way that, you know, it doesn't do what you mentioned earlier in demonizing Black youth? Well, first of all, stop feeding off into the narrative of public officials and giving them more credibility over these young kids and try listening to these young kids. All of this stuff was created to separate families. And I may be one of the oldest individuals uh, taking part on this panel, uh, being almost 60 years of age, I remember when African-American communities did have some forms of services and those services were stripped in a call that the services would be strengthened and that they would be better. Well, what they did do, they stripped these services and they provided nothing uh, for these young kids. Being incarcerated 28 years and returning back in 2009, I am still confused at how this society decayed the way that it decayed. Uh, I still have problems with identity of this society. I still have problems with judges 
that act like they cannot understand that, well, many of these young kids was not born with gold spoons in their mouths. Many of these young kids need opportunity. The opportunity must come through the services that exist. I can tell you one service that exists that many of these young kids don't even know of. And that is that they can receive trauma treatment, that they can receive some form of services through the Chicago Torture Justice Center and many other little agencies, but judges will not give them the opportunity. Our, our entire government is, it's messed up and it needs to be repaired from the days of the 1970s of John Burge all the way up until now, we have been victimized and we have been stomped upon. And one thing I like about these youngsters now today is that they are trying to fight back, but the media will not give them a fair shake. It's just like being downtown when Miracle was attacked by a police officer. Well, media twisted that story. And I don't think that they spoke with over five different individuals that could provide a narrative as to what occurred. Lastly, I would say, give these kids a voice, not a political voice where you're playing political football with their lives, but listen to them. The same way that they can find money for their programs, they should be able to find money to help these young kids that really was born to lose. Yeah, um, thank you. I wanna shift gears a little bit um, to getting into some of the programming that the city does or does not have available and you know uh, some of the work that Alternatives Inc is doing. Um, I'm experiencing some, some delay. Can someone confirm that they can hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, Anna, I know that Alternatives Inc. Um, does actually have um, some programming that is um, geared towards, you know, the the kids that in this this group of this group of kids that we've been talking about. Um, what is what are the required elements of a, an effective violence intervention or diversion program for, for youth in Chicago? And are there any active models, um, including Alternatives Inc. or other uh, models in other cities that Chicago can look to? Yeah, some of the basic ingredients have, have already been talked about. Like Mir Miracle mentioned this piece about um, the, the healing. Uh, Mark talked about the trauma work that needs to happen. Um, and uh, I talked about that, that piece about uh, the, the relationship being so central to this. So um, when we were approached um, about coming up with a restorative response to carjacking, we, we put together all the pieces of all the different kinds of things that we've seen work in different um, arenas and, and put together a program that had these five components. Um, the first one is, a like really strong accompaniment by someone that is is your your primary relationship throughout all of it um and uh, because it's been shown that even just one strong developmental relationship can make a huge difference for a young person right so that's a big piece of this so so someone that's going to whatever other component of this whole thing there's going to be somebody walking alongside you as you're dealing with all these things, so you're not alone. Second is about um, really creating a restorative process so that, um, that that piece about really getting to do some actual reflection on this and have some, some guidance around thinking this through about like what is it that is under the surface here? Like where is this coming from? Um, what, what's missing and, and how do, how do we, um, how do we repair, make, make some kind of amends for, for any harms that have been created in all of this, right? And we look at harms in a holistic way, right? Um, and a lot of healing work is a part of that. So we, we, we um, are an organization that um, 
it has uh, folks from multiple disciplines that are able to work together and see what's needed all together for, for that kind of healing approach. And then um, we, a big piece because um, uh, there's, there's this financial component to, to this sometimes. And so um, it's really important to have um, some kind of um, paid opportunities and that are, that are broad enough so that it's really um, catching people's interests. And so like, like what Mark is talking about, like real opportunities and pathways to actual careers that, that could be a living wage that could be inside of your interests and talents and dreams. Um, and so different tech and trades and arts and all of we, we give them access to those different kinds of things that are out there, but they're just not necessarily reaching these young people. Yeah. Um, oh, go, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Well, there's the last piece is about um, really uh, all along the way you're engaging, 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 because um, one of the things that we, we were seeing was that um, young people uh, sometimes where it wasn't just about like um, taking it to the chop shop. It was, it was really like uh, sometimes it'd be, we're going to take a, a BMW and then dump it and then go steal a Honda. And so this kind of shows a, a thing where it's like, okay, this is maybe more thrill seeking than about like trying to, you know, get some, some money right in an organized way. So um a lot of there, all of this stuff around like as a young person that doesn't have anything to do in the pandemic like we, we got to actually um provide positive outlets for some of that thrill seeking and like being able to put something in place and then at the end have a rites of passage so that who you're in that time of your life you're you're really trying to um a, experiment with who who am I and who am I going to be in the world and that can change from one moment to the next like you know one moment I'm I'm in school and I got these dreams for this and that and the other moment but like I'm with this set of friends and they're like let's go steal a car it's is um a, a rites of passage is, is something where it's like a it, it's a pipeline of a different sort <laughs> instead of school to prison Right, so it's uh, pulls people into like, like this is me defining who I'm gonna be in the world and have a sense of grounding in that and a community around you that sees you that way to counter some of these media messages that Mark is talking about. So mm -hmm. that's what that's what our program put all together. <laughs> yeah, um, no, and it's I I think you know critical programming and um, the last time that we spoke with Alternatives Inc. Um, I believe that the program didn't have a formal relationship with the court. Is that still the case? Right. We've been having, so yeah, we, we had an initial conversation where we were putting the idea out there and got some initial interest and in what remains to be seen is what kind of traction comes from that. So, got it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, and I think that's a very interesting um, part of this whole issue is, and Mark, you kind of mentioned this, the city, or depending on who you talk to, what city official you talk to might say that, you know, there are hundreds or however many pro programs available to Chicago's youth. Um, but, you know, the juvenile just the juvenile court officials, the judges that we spoke with, you know, said they were frustrated because they didn't even have the, um, the discernment or the ability to refer kids to those programs. Um, and so, Mark, I'm curious, who do you think are you know the critical actors as an as an organizer or an activist that you would be you know reaching out to hoping to you know kind of light a fire underneath to begin to prioritize a solution moving forward well that's kind of very easy to answer state legislators and senators we okay. need these programs to be implemented within our courts they have the authority to do so. Our judges are very punitive and it would be very, very difficult to get these programs implemented uh, by way of the county. Uh, as Anna has stated, 
her program is still not recognized within our criminal justice system. So you mean to tell me that we can have programs that exist, but they're not recognized in way to send these young kids off down state with a prison term. So lastly, we have to target our state uh, legislators and our state senators and we must demand that some of these programs be implemented into the policy of the juvenile court system, and they are the ones who can do so. Got it. Well, we only have a, a couple of minutes left, so Miracle, um, I want to end with you really quickly. Um, you know, you're a youth organizer with Good Kids Mad City, so you know I expect that you would have a pulse on. Um, really the pulse of what your peers um, are saying they need immediately. Um, and, you know, just being around, you know, uh, Chicago's youth in these communities, what are you sensing or hearing is the immediate need um, of kids who are in this particular situation? Well, I think it's financial security. That's what I hear. That's what I see. That's what I know what's going on. And do you say they need mental help because they not feeling well, they depressed, they might be going through anxiety, things like that. I'm not asking anyone their situation unless they tell me, you know. And basically they trying to escape gun violence in their community. So like being financially secure will like bring away some worries where some moms end up moving because they scared of the neighborhood they in. They just get ready to leave Chicago, but sometimes when you have financial insecurity going on at home, like I said, it forces you to make desperate situations and desperate decisions that they shouldn't have to because see, uh, the city of Chicago pays less than $15 an hour. Like that's not a salary. Let's pay our essential workers a, a actual pay and pay them a salary. Let's pay people who work at McDonald's actually an actual salary because at the end of the day, it is a job. And so like, I think when we talk about once again, what our youth are out here doing, and why are they behaving in such ways and portray such demeanors? Like they don't have opportunity. They don't have financial security. So of course they in the street doing something. They don't have no business trying to find a way up. So that's how I feel. Um, yeah. Um, well, I want to thank you all for just providing such rich and thoughtful insights on what I think we can all agree is a critical conversation. Um, I think that Olivia might have some questions from the audience. So I will pass it to you. Thanks, Sydney. Um, we have one question and oh, of course the timer will go off. Um, we have one question. Uh, we talked, uh, BGA um, talked to many parents who, you know, lamented in their inability to keep their kids away from the rougher influences. This question is coming from our editor, um, is there a, is this a broader problem um, about the unfairness in the community? Are there strategies for parents to help them steer their kids away from bad elements or culture of neglect? And again, um, this is coming from parents who uh, shared with the BGA uh, that they just don't have the abilities to keep their kids away from rougher influences. So. Um, if anyone can chime in on that that question. I think rougher influences is like, I feel like you are persuaded to be in a, a rough influence based on what you've been through in your background. Because if you want to look at the real issue of gun violence, it stems from poverty and insecurities, house insecurity, food insecurities, financial insecurity. So like, don't look at those gangbangers on the corner and judge them because you never know what that person did or what happened to that person and what they went through that got them there. It's time to stop looking at people and judging them. And I would say, like, and don't be, once again, like, don't be blaming the youth. It's the city fault it has come this far because the police duty is to serve and protect, but they have not been. They have been just finding our communities, sending our black and brown brothers, daddies, uncles, fathers to jail. And so you got mothers out here that's raising families by themselves. You got families out here that's going through things. And basically it's because mass incarceration, their fathers are locked up. They don't have a man in their life to steer them in the right direction and tell them about the gangbangers on the corner. 
So, like, once again, and we being real here, it's about this punitive system that's taking our loved ones away and we put these stigmatizations on them and label them as criminals and restrain them from getting jobs and going after opportunities that they may have, would have went out if they had a job. Like, it's so many people I know that our families that would have said, I wish I get a job. I wish I could be doing something like you, but I can't because I'm a felon and so on and so forth. So like, once again, we talk about our youth. They don't even have bonds when they go to juvenile. They don't have bonds. You can't get bonded out. You stand there until you age up into the system. So like, once again, another root cause. And this is Mark. You know, I learned from people like Miracle. I learned from our youth and returning back into society. And she's exactly right. You know, our system as a whole have played us as political footballs and they have totally so far gotten away with its game. And it was all designed uh, to increase its profit behind mass incarceration. As uh, she describes, a youth is not even entitled to a bond hearing in the state of Illinois unless they are tried as an adult. And I think that the mechanisms behind our criminal justice system, it works hand in hand as to why some of these young youth are basically they're hopeless they should not have to be sent away and then once they return then they cannot get a job i think the real solution to all of these problems is through hiring many individuals that have been to prisons and giving them an opportunity to work with these youth uh, and to kind of like steer them in the right direction. But our criminal justice system and the systems in general, uh, they have basically, they have demonized people that have come out of prison to make sure that the 13th Amendment is basically intact the entire way. And really demonizing black mothers too and it's like if, if you're not blaming the child you're blaming the parents and that's just as narrow it, you have to be able to look at things in a systemic way because everything is connected this is <laughs> if this mother doesn't live in a bubble this there's all these things impacting because <laughs> yeah it makes me really upset um Leave it there. I want to point out that you know Miracle uh, in our our Zoom chat, um, a black and brown youth being indicted, indicted is a win. Money and a bonus for CPD and our judges. Everyone is profiting from our youth being criminalized. Um, are those your sentiments as well, um, Mark and Anna? Yes. Yes. Yeah. From our schools straight to prison without any opportunity. They were not provided opportunity before they were sent to prison. And once out of prison, they are provided no opportunity. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. And until this country as a whole face the realization that it's uh, so-called systems that they have set up has failed and that it has failed big time and that the victims of this have been young people all across this country, then we're going to keep going through this. You know, just briefly going back to the fact around the Burge era where young kids taken down to police stations and having their genitals and testicles grabbed and squeezed, they were not even provided a voice inside of the courtroom because they couldn't talk. They were told to sit at a table while their attorneys basically represented them regardless if the attorney was a good attorney or a bad attorney. 
We are underrepresented as a people, not just legally, but on all levels. And for young people, in 1994, this logic makes its way to the juvenile justice system and then into the schools, this whole idea of super predators that, you know, are, it can show no remorse that, that, you know, you just have to lock them up, throw away the key, zero tolerance, no chances. And so then it becomes, you know, even before encountering the cop, it's inside the embedded inside of your school. And this has been for decades now. And then uh, the privatization and, and the um, stratification of, of schooling in Chicago. It's, it's just like the, the, when you start looking at all the different things all together, it's, it's really hard to, to just have this, this um, finger pointing at, at Black youth. I wanted to point out, um, Mark, you continually say that kids um, are demonized. And Anna, I, I wonder if you had um, any thoughts on or elaborations on that, um, especially working at alternatives and trying to put together restorative justice programming uh, for all types of, uh, uh, well, for children with all types of um, charges on them um, or interactions with Cook County. Uh, so what does it mean for, what does it mean for children to be demonized in the system as, as Mark has pointed out? Yeah, it would be like the opposite of being humanized, right? So instead of getting to be a child, you are seen as a criminal. And so how does that play out? Okay, well, you know, the same behavior that, that looks like, um, and is treated like, um, you know, a, a, a learning moment, you know, like you, 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 don't un, you don't understand, you don't know any better, you need guidance, you need, you need support. All of a sudden, if, if it's a black youth, all of that goes out the window. It's like, no, this is, this is um, what we can expect from you. And it's, it's almost, it's this idea of it, it being, um, same behavior, different lens. And so you attribute different things to it. And so you don't see trauma in front of you when this, when this child is acting out in your class. What you see is uh, someone that um, is, is defiant, someone that is, is, um, is, is needs punishment. And so they go actually into a different system, right? So it's, it's a different call that you make. Um, and, and so what we're doing is trying to do some really embedded work inside of different spaces and people that work with young people, having them be able to see behavior in, in this way where it's like, this is, this is trauma or this is, you know, uh, development, developmentally appropriate based on what this child has gone through. <laughs> and so, um, it, it's it's this thing about the, the lens, right? And so we, we look at um, white youth um, and the, the kinds of misbehavior that, that they get um, supports for, and we don't see any kind of that, that same logic applied in communities of color. Um, it goes all the way off through. So the sentencing, all of the different Mm -hmm. um, off ramps that you might have to ending up in the criminal legal system. It's felt and implemented throughout the process. Yes. Um, Miracle mentioned in, in the chat about the school to prison pipeline. And um, of course, we all heard uh, that um, a lot of CPS high schools have voted to reallocate funds um, and essentially defund, um, you know, uh, police um, activity at their schools. Uh, I wanted to get y'all's thoughts on what that 
what that means and what that could actually look like for, for schools, for students, for the parents, um, particularly Black youth um, in CPS. But then also, um, you know, what's your take on the existing um, presence of police uh, in, in schools today in Chicago? Um, I attended a CPS school that had cops in the school and cops only came out, they were listed as school resource officers, weren't even a resource to the school, only came out when there was a fight. That's not protection when you slamming somebody on the ground, you don't even know. Did you ain't even get to know this kid? Like y'all not in the hallways interacting, you're not going to the school, I mean, in the classrooms, learning what it's about, learning what they're about, knowing the kids in the classroom. You're not learning their personalities, you're not learning their characteristics, you're not getting to know students. You're just coming out when the fight happens, now you know it's approach the situation with violence. So once we get cops out of schools and get more mental health services in schools, such as counselors and therapists that can talk to our youth when they're having a bad day or acting out in class, then we can talk about school resource officers. Maybe the therapists and counselors will be our resource officer. And, and real quick, let me add to that question too. You know, does this play a role in um, whether or not, you know, police activities are funded in schools? Does it play a role when it comes to students, children getting involved in crimes outside of school, um, you know, how does that, how does having those resources, those alternative resources in schooling provide change or, or you know, different environments for, for kids outside? I feel like when cops are in school, they're not looking at what their kid is doing in school. They gonna look up to uh, what kids coming up to them snitching saying, oh, so-and-so in a gang. And, so-and-so say he doing this and so-and-so doing that. That ain't gonna do nothing but make the police go tell somebody in the district, hey, I'm a resource officer at this school and I heard one of the kids tell me so-and-so does this. Let's hyper surveillance this kid. Like that's all that does. Like it don't do nothing but get the police on our youth back, watching them in their communities, stereotyping them for wearing a hoodie, walking to the store, coming from school. And it's just further criminalization. Ain't no way no cops supposed to be in any school. And that's just how I feel, bottom line. They're not a resource to the school. We need to stop calling them student resource officers because they're not a resource. They sit at their desk until a fight happens and they come and get a paycheck for nothing. Just have the police patrol our streets and ride around all day and just look at what's going on. But every time something happens, y'all not there preventing violence from occurring. Y'all always show up late when it already occurred. They're not doing any violence prevention, bottom line. They're not doing any violence prevention in school because if you was, fights wouldn't even break out. You make sure that the school environment is healthy and, uh, and stable for everyone's mental health. If it was drama going on as a police, don't you think you should approach that situation with care? No, because you guys are not trained to. You guys are not trained to be in schools. You're not dealing with people who have mental health issues. You're not trained to deal with people who have mental health issues. So once again, cops out of CPS. And that's another step towards abolishing CPD, period. And this is Mark. I totally agree. Uh, up until perhaps the mid 1970s, there were no comps in schools and we didn't have no problems. Of course, we fist fault, but that was just common. They didn't turn us into criminals at that very young age. I believe that all Chicago uh, police officers need to be removed out of Chicago public schools. And I believe that the resources that they're using to pay these police officers, that resource needs to be given back to uh, the black and brown communities uh, to help these people. Having police officers in schools have not helped. It has showed us as a recent court decision back in 2012, they did not even have to read these kids their Miranda rights on school property. So I don't think that we have moved in a way to help these kids. We have moved in ways to hurt these kids. And believe it or not, we have stripped their opportunities away from them for these sellout opportunities that uh, our elected officials has told us. There's so much to say to this. 
schools are where young people are at for a long period of time. And so what, are, what resources they get in school makes a really big difference about what happens to them in their life, right? So it's, it's not removed from what's going on in the community, right? The first piece um, to your question. The police officers are trained within a legal lens. It's, it's foundational. So it's not like, you know, we're just gonna give them an RJ training and that's gonna go away. This is, it's, it's um, there's uh, often this thing that um, school officials wanna do where it's like, we'll have our restorative justice practitioner in the school and then we'll also have our, our police officers and we'll do both and it'll be great. Like there's no issue with that. But really um, they're, they're opposing approaches. And so it's like you're in your, you know, uh, trying to do two very opposite things. Um, and so some, sometimes there would be a fight and um, I'm not able to go in and de-escalate it based off of my relationships with the young people because Officer Friendly decided that they were gonna handle it. And, you know, when Officer Friendly sees it, it's disorderly conduct. And it's, that's a legal thing. And so all oh, that he thinks that it's his department. Um, when you could actually see it from a totally different lens if you're thinking about restorative violence intervention and prevention work, right? And so it's, it's um, you know, they just have that one hammer and it's, it, you, you can't use that on everything. It doesn't actually work. And then, where is all the money for being able to do these, these effective student-centered approaches that have been proven again and again and again that it works? All that money is tied up in the punitive system. That's where the money is. We, the miracles that we are um, expected to make with the, the little uh, pennies that we get in the budget, um, it's it's amazing. And then they're like, you know, but show us the, the proof. Where's the evidence base? And then on the punitive side, where, you know, like they, they don't have to show that it's working at all because it hasn't been working at all in terms of actually making people safer, right? So, you know, the we have all this, this um, burden of proof and you know you got to make sure that it works before you let the, the the youth workers get a a chance at solving this issue and then on the punitive side it's like well that's that's the way it is that's the default you know that's where you know 1.8 billion dollars is in the city and then we have we <laughs> our little budgets um yeah that's fundamentally the you know like looking at where the money's at and where it's going if they if they would give us even half of that to actually work on actual public safety work versus policing people, then we could actually put the the real investment behind like all right we're gonna we're going to take this to scale we're gonna have this be the the default instead of some marginal experiment on the side which is already always relegated to a pilot. Yeah, um, on a, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I thought I heard somebody chiming in. Um, early on, um, you mentioned just how vital schools are or and have been for, for families. And that's something that we found a lot when we were talking to families, you know, kids would say, you know, my, my son has basketball practice typically, or he has football practice or band or whatever, but, you know, schools being closed because of the pandemic, you know, really turned life upside down for us. Um, and, you know, flaws aside, right, and, and CPS and, you know, the, the challenges there alone, but what difficulties or imbalances do you think the pandemic has revealed, um, and anybody can answer this question, the pandemic has revealed in just how heavily parents rely on school-based programming um, to, you know, keep their kids safe and anchored? Yeah, I mean, it's, that word anchoring is, is a, a, a big thing that came to mind. It's like they, um, 
when you you don't have this huge safety net and the, and all of this web of relationships like sometimes it's like the the one person in that school be it um sometimes the the front office lady that's like an auntie to you or it's the the janitor or it's this one teacher that you had in the whatever grade that that person makes a really big difference for a young person and so um and especially when um people's um families are, are torn apart in all these different ways by the state so like the issues that miracle talked about where, where it's like being pulled apart from incarceration or the um uh child protective services always being up in different families um that the school becomes another place where you can sometimes get some of those critical relationships of, of care and so that 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 one place uh, all of a sudden being shut down and people not having that they, they they lost access a lot of times to the the therapist that they were able to access through there or the, the school um, counselor or social worker as as overburdened as they were you know sometimes able to catch things and and now they um have had no way to to reach young people in a lot of ways. All of the, the programs after school, um, it was it was devastating to a lot of our families. And quickly, I think that the pandemic has taught us that we don't need the prison system the way that others have felt that we have needed it. I think in the state of Illinois, the prison system is now under 30,000. We were floating at 44,000 to 45,000 when the pandemic hit. And I think that many individuals were released, individuals that would probably have never been released back into society because they had natural life uh, sentences. I don't think that any of these men or women have re-offended and that is something that needs to be talked a little bit more about due to the fact that people were turned into merchandise by our criminal justice system now they don't see uh basically the profit angle of it and now they're willing to let go some of everyone out of our prison system Thank you, Mark. Um, I want to check in with Olivia on time really quickly because I know we're really close. Okay, so uh, we have two minutes left. Um, so if anyone has any burning thoughts left, um, I'd love just to, anything that we didn't touch on um, or just something that may have stuck out from the conversation. I'd just love to open the floor um, for everyone to share briefly. I <laughs> I think Go ahead, I think about the mayor at this point, like uh, G Camp C, we have been meeting with her team about our peace book ordinance and getting passed on a state level as the peace book will make peace in everyday normal on our city of Chicago blocks. And we are demanding 2% of CPD budget that will give us $35.2 million to start phasing our peace book ordinance and funding our peace book ordinance. And we are demanding that it does come from CPD's budget. And so I'm just, I need to get, we need to get in conversation with her specifically, not anyone from because she stole our idea and made this watered down data collection form about where violence is occurring. And that's one of the things that the people will do is track violence and like the communities we work in and how if we do this work in our communities, how we can track violence to see if our ideas are really working. And we've done this before because these are tried and true practices that our people ordinance will serve to and be a wraparound service and provide opportunity for our black and brown youth and uplift those lost to gun violence. So this is a call out to the mayor. I'm sick of it at this point. <laughs> well, one thing that I would say for certain that we need to dismantle the punitive angle of our criminal justice system. As a kid, when crimes were committed, children were treated as children. They were given at best a few months inside of our juvenile facilities, and they were actually provided with programs to restructure their lives. We need those programs back. 
couldn't say it better. Great. Well, again, I, I just really want to thank you all um, for participating in this conversation. Um, just over the course of reporting the story, I mean, I found the individual stories that that we've talked to people and heard um, heartbreaking and just collectively, um, the systemic issue is clearly very critical um, for a group of youth who are, you know, at a, a critical age in their lives. Um, and so I thank you all each for, for the work that you're doing and for contributing to this conversation. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sydney. Um, and thank you, uh, Echo at Sydney's uh, sentiment there. Um, a little round of applause for our panelists um, and Sydney, our moderator. Thank you so much for um, joining us in this conversation on Black youth carjacking and the Cook County juvenile um, justice system. Um, if you have any questions about the conversation about the story, uh, feel free to check us out on BGA uh, site, um, bettergov.org. Um, you can also ask any questions through our What the Gov uh, form that you can find on bettergov.org slash civic. Uh, and like we said, we will have a recording of this event um, on our BGA YouTube page. So please feel free to subscribe to our UP. YouTube page um, to have updates on when that will come out. Uh, thank you again, and I hope everyone has a good night.